Well, good evening everybody and hopefully the masses will roll in uh, and we're going to do a workshop talking about uh, organic hops, uh, organic hop growing and in order to do that we're going to give you a bit of an introduction to what beer actually is and what it's made up of uh, and tell you about uh, uh, some of the um, sort of botany around hops uh, and in amongst it we're also going to chat about a, uh, an in innovative farmers project that was looking at um, uh, uh, the, the production of disease tolerant hops. So I say tolerant rather than resistant because nothing can be totally resistant, it's about just having tolerance and surviving it. Um, just do you want to introduce yeah. yourself? So I'm Izzy from the Organic Research Centre. Um, we were part of the Innovative Farmers um, Organic Hops Field Lab, working with Greg and two other farmers as well. Um, so yeah, it was three years. Um, it concluded in March earlier this year. Um, yeah. What should we talk about? Well, if I, I just say, you know, well, I, um, I started Strayer Brewery now 18 years ago. Uh, it's a dedicated organic brewery, so we now only brew organic beers. Uh, and that interest in uh, organic production really stemmed before that. I was just saying to Izzy, I actually came to this farm now 26 years ago uh, because I was interested in setting up a veggie box scheme at the time. I came and did a case study on the farm uh, for the Soil Association. And I actually then worked for a number of years uh, at the Soil Association uh, and started their CSA project. I did a feasibility study on CSAs and was really interested in collecting people uh, with where their food came from. So when I landed in Stroud uh, as a member of Stroud Community Agriculture, uh, I sort of needed a reason to be there. Um, and my interest in beer, my interest in food, my interest in community uh, really sort of gave it the spark to start up this brewery. And of course, the first thing I did was look for local malt and it wasn't very long before we started using uh, organic malt as well. Um, so, um, sorry, I'm snivelling, I've got a cold. <laughs> um, so the two main ingredients in beer are uh, barley and the second main ingredient is, well, the main ingredient is actually water, but the agricultural ingredients are barley and hops. Uh, barley is what gives the sugar for the, for the beer uh, that then gets fermented by uh, fungus, the yeast, uh, but it's the hops that is the flavour and the spice of the beer. Uh, and it is like, like a spice, it's the most expensive uh, and most sort of uh, uh, impactful ingredient in, in our beers. As an organic brewery, uh, we have a much reduced selection of hops that we can pick from. So a conventional brewery might have several hundred hop varieties that it can use. As an organic brewery, we're talking about 30 or 40 hop varieties that we can choose from. Um, shall I carry on? Talk? Do you want to talk about hop retirement or shall I talk about that? Um, <laughs> I don't think yeah? Yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, I was thinking yeah. that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Have a yeah. go. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, so in the UK, it's actually quite well suited in the UK to growing hops um, because hops are, their growth is dependent on um, daylight hours rather than temperature. Um, so it's well suited for growing hops, but there's obviously the weather is um, a big barrier to diseases and pests that we have in the UK. Um, and there was a obviously a huge industry of growing hops in the UK, uh, especially the Herefordshire, Worcestershire area, and also in the southeast. Um, and then throughout the 1800s, there's been a decline into the 1900s. Um, so now it's I'm not sure of the numbers, but it's very low hop production um, and very low organic hop production. I think there's only three farms um, in the UK that grow, grow like exclusively organic hops, there's not much really to no. select from um, and not very many breweries that are exclusively organic as well. Um, so yeah, part of the field lab has been trying to find varieties that are more um, tolerant to diseases and pests to be able to increase the amount of hop production within the UK um, and we've also been trying to find varieties that are going to be more tolerant to changing climates, so milder winters, um, there might not be diseases and the diseases and pests that might have been killed off with more frost um, wouldn't be um, with milder winters. So yeah. Mm. Yeah. So I think this is probably a good time to start with a beer. Uh, the first beer that we, you're going to try is actually a German style Kolsch. 
uh, and that's because it's almost October and actually the end of September is when we have an October fest uh, and actually last night I was up quite, quite late for a German techno night uh, at Stroud Brewery where this is one of our seasonal brews uh, but uh, one of the main hops in there is actually a hop variety called Merlin which is grown on one of our uh, two uh, main commercial organic farms but it's a variety that he's decided not to continue so it's now an extinct or almost extinct <laughs> uh, hop variety uh, because it was so susceptible to fungal disease so that's on the way out but as a as a beer style it's quite interesting uh, in the UK we tend to grow, uh, brew um, uh, ales with yeast that likes to ferment at the top of the beer. In Europe they tend to use yeast that ferment in the bottom of the beer and give those sort of lager styles. Now this is an ale um, uh, style yeast, so the sort of uh, yeast that we're used to in our, in our uh, regular cast beers, but then it's been cold matured for about a month that gives it somewhat of a sort of lager type character. So it's a hybrid a, or a hybrid beer between sort of an ale and a, and a lager uh, with quite a traditional hop and say so the main hop in there is Merlin which is on the way out it was a failure because it was um, uh, susceptible to fungal attack really and it, and it just didn't produce a commercial crop and I'm going to say a bit about that now you know um, uh, hops before the 15th century weren't really used as the main uh, 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 flavoring ingredient uh, Brewsters, uh, the brewers, women who mainly brewed would create their own flavoring from different um, um, uh, herbs and, and spices. But things like woodruff, uh, bog myrtle, willow, uh, things that would give a contrast to the sweetness of the malt. So it's usually bittering uh, herbs. Uh, it was the, we might have even used hops in the UK, but not on a large scale. It was the Belgians and the Belgian monks that really got into hops, uh, and as well as uh, giving bitterness to counteract the, the, the sweetness, they also discovered that it gave um, some sort of um, um, uh, preservative to it as well. And actually, the, the chemicals in the hop are uh, antibacterial, antifungal, and they, they're uh, produced to try and protect the plant from uh, attack. Uh, so each variety has its own sort of chemical makeup and has different flavours and that's one of the reasons why it sort of produces these things. Uh, and actually what we could do, uh, so here we're, we're actually in the middle of uh, hop harvest right now. Uh, we've got some fresh hops and we can pass them round. Um, and the next few beers, are just to sort of illustrate the, the, uh, the family, the two closest botanical cousins to hops are uh, hemp, and the nettle. Um, and if you look at the, the leaf on the, the bits you're showing around, you see the little leaves on there look very nettly. Uh, and the more mature leaves have that sort of um, digitated uh, leaf, more like a, a hemp. Uh, and the stalk of the plant you'll feel is rough in one direction and smooth in the other. And that's, I think, like a nettle, but the, in the hop it's sort of um, adapted to help it climb. Um, traditionally, it's a hedgerow plant, so it lives in a, a diverse mix of, uh, of other plants. But in the commercial setting, uh, it gets forced to grow down the middle of a field. And each hop variety that we know of, a Fuggles, a Golding, a Challenger, is actually a cutting, a clone, a propagated replica of an individual plant. So each uh, variety is identical forced down to, to live in the middle of a, a field that it's not usually used to. So if something comes along that's, that's going to attack it, it will wipe out the whole crop. A hop farmer, the kit they use to string up, harvest, dry and preserve the hops is only used for hops. It's not like a combine that they can use for a multiple variety of, of crops. So there's quite a lot of capital investment involved in hop growing. Uh, and if that hot crop uh, doesn't make it, then you've lost quite a lot of money. And actually, traditionally, hot grain was more of a cash crop. It was grown on small amounts in a garden. It's horticulture. It's not arable. It's horticulture. It really is gardening. And uh, it was done to bring cash into the household. It would have been small scale for small scale little breweries. And it wasn't really into the turn of the century that big breweries demanded uh, more hop. Uh, and they sort of commercialized it and sort of industrialized it to some extent. Uh, and they 
uh, wanted cheap bitterness, so they selected varieties that gave lots of bitterness for a little plant, and all the different diversity got lost. So we ended up with the sort of characteristic hops that we know of, but lost a lot of their local diversity. Um, and that's where the problems started to begin. Uh, and that's been compounded by several centuries now of hop growing to build up a good disease bank. <laughs> uh, and the varieties that we've got are no longer really capable of dealing with the disease that it's facing them. And that's been exacerbated more recently, as, as Izzy says, because uh, the weather's getting warmer, uh, it's favoring uh, funguses, and actually the range of the hops, we're now hitting the sort of margins of it. So it's quite difficult. Um, even on a global level, we have a problem. So Germany's also suffering from the same sort of thing. Uh, America is a huge hop growing country. It's now eclipsed Germany in terms of area. I think it's about evens in terms of weight. Uh, but in order to favor hop growing, they shifted a lot of their hop industry to the west coast. Um, and uh, hops like lots of sunshine and warm weather, but they don't like um, dry roots. They want to be irrigated and damp. So they rely on irrigation for their hops. And most of that irrigation is from snow meltwater and they're just not getting snow. So the world uh, hop um, harvest is actually very vulnerable. And that's why we were interested in uh, two things. One, low intervention hop growing uh, because we didn't want to have chemicals and pesticides and herbicides on the, on the hop, but uh, also looking at how uh, organic growing can help that tolerance and resistance. Okay, uh, uh, have, have you tried, have you drunk your Kolsch? I think we're probably good to go on to one of the next beers, which, which is our Hempathy. Uh, it actually hasn't got hemp leaf in it. We just use, because you can't really put hemp leaf in, in products in the UK without licenses and things like that. So uh, to, to sort of um, uh, to celebrate the hemp, we put uh, hemp flour in the mash. So it actually doesn't give any hempy flavor at all. Uh, but it does give a bit of a nutty characteristic. Uh, and this is a mild style. Uh, and mild is actually a less hopped beer. Uh, so it's not that it's, you know, particularly weak or anything, but it's just less hoppy. And I don't know how it is because it's out of date. <laughs> it's the last few cases, but it should be fine. I say out of date, it's past its best before. <laughs> Are we too early for questions? No, far away. I'm curious, I'm assuming that a lot of hops, including organic, are still monoculture, but is there anything that you can do to increase the biodiversity in generation? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you could plant varieties together, but obviously that would complicate harvesting, and yeah, it would just make it a bit more of a difficult harvesting period. Um, but as it's a hedgerow plant, I mean, it's you could plant varieties below it, which um, benefit maybe have beneficial insects within them um, and that could increase the biodiversity of the soil as well um, so yeah it's mostly grown as a monoculture just for ease um, but you're not often finding people who farm hops also doing other general produce um, yeah I mean the two farms that we had in the field lab um, they had orchards as well um, yeah I think it's not just hops mm. for the majority of organic hop farmers. Yeah. And they did do so, so hops are grown in rows. You want to be able to get a tractor or some machinery down them. Uh, and those inter rows were planted quite often with, you know, um, um, a cover crop that either gave uh, flowers for, for uh, pollinators or something just to suppress weeds. So, you know, the hops, especially again in the organic setting where I can't use herbicide, you want to suppress the competition. Uh, but it's a balance between suppressing the competition and water, because hops want that water. And if you're growing other things, they compete for water. Uh, and so it's about balancing that, uh, that thing. So it's usually cover crops when the hops aren't growing, and then they get mown out, don't they? Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, yeah. And also like broadleaf weeds as well, they'll increase the chances of wilt. Um, so you yeah. want to make sure that they're completely gone before you yeah. start growing the hops. Do you 
Again, I think it probably could work because that's where they grow in their natural setting. But again, as Izzy said, the broad leaves and the trees tend to carry quite a lot of the diseases that they face. Uh, they want sunshine, um, so they tend to live on on the on the edges of woodland. They're a sort of uh, edge crop. Uh, and you want to be able to easily harvest them, so you still want to have them strung up and uh, yeah, so it is a tricky, yeah, it's a very <laughs> tricky crop and a very tricky yeah, plant to grow. Um, yeah, so the other thing to say about plant, we're talking about, uh, you know, the hop plant at the moment, you know, all those uh, plants, the, the hop, the head, the nettle, they're all dioecious, they have both male and female plants as separate plants. Uh, and like the others, all the goodies are in the female plant. Uh, and you can see that, the, you know, in front of you, these are in flower. Um, and what we can do is we can turn these around. There's two bags here. In fact, I think I wrote them. Yes, that's 257. So there's two bags of hops. There's one that says 257 on there very faintly, and that's one of the test varieties that we have from the UK. So it's an organic uh, UK hop, and we can pass that round. And the other one is a bag of Amarillo, which is actually an American uh, hop variety that was um, has become very popular. It was one of those first very sort of punchy, aromatic hops that came out of the States now uh, about 20 years, well, just less than 20 years ago. Uh, and when you get the bag, if you pull out a, a, a flower, break it in half, rub it between your fingers, and you'll feel the oiliness, the resins, and that is the sort of volatile oils, the essentials that give that uh, aroma. Yeah, I'll pass this one around the other way. I can't remember. <laughs> you somebody's going to ask me that. I really can't remember. <laughs> I should too. Yeah, so do grab a flower. Rub it really hard between your, your fingers and thumb, feel the greasiness of it, and then once it's warmed up, have a sniff and you can uh, really smell the aroma. And that really comes out in the Amarillo. The Amarillo is a far more aromatic hop. So in this program, as well as getting resistance to, or tolerance to disease, farmers also want other characteristics. And you know, they want to be good for brewing. They want to have some aroma or some good bitterness. Uh, you were talking about, um, you know, the potential to have mixed hops. One of the things that uh, hop farmers want to do is to get uh, staggered um, ripening times because you don't want all your hops ripening all at the same time. They want to ripen over several weeks so they can uh, have a bit of time to actually harvest them. So it's about ripening times, it's about the flavour and aroma, it's about disease uh, tolerance. Uh, and again, uh, in the organic setting, it's also about its sort of morphology. Maybe Izzy could say something about yeah. <laughs> what we discovered about that. Um, yeah, so in the field lab, um, there was two farmers that we had there on the Herefordshire Worcestershire border, and then the one was in Kent, so they're the predominant crop growing regions in the UK. Um, and we really wanted to, um, we worked with the um, breeder, hop breeder, um, with the farmers, and we wanted to find hops that were suited to the tall um, hop system in place in Herefordshire, Worcestershire, the, the dwarfs are in Herefordshire, Worcestershire and the tall hops in Kent. Um, so there was two different systems that we were trying to find suitable varieties for um, and there was, I don't know how many varieties, a lot were tested but there was um, four successful ones, um, so Sovereign in Endeavour in Herefordshire and Worcestershire and then there was um, Challenger and then a variety which hasn't been named yet it's called 3294 um, and that was I think one of the most popular at the pilot brew tasting that we had um, and these ones were they were resistant to the diseases and the pests um, well more resistant um, mm -hmm. they had a yield um, and so Challenger is going to be the error of it is going to be increased um, at the Kent farm um, and yeah, that's what we found from the field lab. And it was also about bringing all the key stakeholders together. Um, so it's a very small industry, the organic hops industry. Um, and it's coming up with the challenges and the solutions to these challenges all together was a really important part as well. Yeah, I think uh, one of the biggest learnings for, uh, for me was just really understanding the huge challenge. It's an almost impossible task to actually get an, a, a crop of hops through and especially an organic crop of hops and just the sheer 
vulnerability of our brewing industry that, uh, uh, you know, as drinkers, we totally take for granted. And, uh, you know, the uh, sort of conclusion that we, we reached, you know, maybe just say something a bit more about the breeding program. Uh, in order to find a new variety of hop, um, it's literally uh, a, a, a cross maybe between two known parents, of course, and then every seed that's produced is genetically different. So each little seed will produce a plant that has its own characteristics. Those get grown on, uh, and the first thing to do is to subject them to a bit of disease. So literally, they go and spray a bit of mildew on them, and then anybody who makes it goes through, um, and they get planted out and grown into a little plant, and they see you know, what sort of characteristics are coming through. Is it growing up quickly enough? Does it look like a good sort of plant to grow? Uh, then, uh, to actually understand what's coming through as a hop, you've got to grow it for at least a year or two before it can produce a, a hop flower. Uh, and certainly, the, you know, anything interesting that, that looks at, like it's a contender might get replicated and you know, propagated into more plants to have a slightly more commercial yield. And that takes about, was it three to five years yeah. to get to that point? We try it, it looks interesting, we plant it on a commercial scale, and like Merlin, it failed. So that, that was several years to you know, just get a single variety. So the, the, the real difficulty is just putting through the numbers, the huge scale numbers to get these new varieties that might actually work as a, as a commercial crop. Uh, and I think um, there, there is now some work that's fairly interesting, I don't know too much about it, that's the genetic markers, isn't it? So um, uh, they're looking at characteristics and hop that uh, might you know select for resistance and, uh, or tolerance of various things or uh, different um, uh, sort of brewing traits and you can then very quickly identify them and bring those hops, uh, hops through so you know DNA work genetic work to just mark those characteristics is actually accelerating that in hops and I would imagine in other horticulture as well okay It's interesting. I think hops will grow pretty much anywhere. Uh, they do like fairly rich soil and they do like a good amount of sunshine. Uh, and of course, Kent and Herefordshire have those things. I think what really helped boost the hop industry in those areas is actually labor because Birmingham, London provided seasonal labor at the time to harvest those hops, which then encouraged those areas to grow more commercially. But you can grow hops anywhere. Um, yeah, I think it helps to be fairly flat. Yeah. <laughs> I think both the farms had good fertility as yeah. well. Um, they were very similar soil types. Both had, they were quite clay soils as well. So yeah, similar. I was just interested about things about brewing, like around Scandinavia, there's an explosion in horticultural growth. Is it, you know, do you think that back in the day it was a horticultural crop done on less on big scales because they were more eager? Is that the volumes you need for what you do just to stroud brewing? Does it still need to be like a big monoculture operation? Or can those volumes be produced with crops in smaller growers? Well, it's, um, again, it's about. Um, efficiency and cost so even as a an organic crop we pay at least 30 to 50 percent more for uh, hops so uh, a non-organic hop is 15 to 20 pounds a kilo we're paying 30 to 45 and 50 pounds a kilo for hops i mean we we you know i say it's a smaller portion of our brew but it is uh, an increased cost if you started doing that slightly less mechanized you know maybe more uh, hand uh, in fact hand harvesting would be impossible it just wouldn't stack up at all and to give you an idea i think you know the the hop producers in the uk have, have reduced drastically i don't know what the original numbers were but they have declined considerably and i think there's now only 75 hop growers in the uk of which two are uh, organic hop growers the hop that i passed around the american hop amarillo 
the organic part of the farm that the Ar Ar Amarillo grows on is larger than the entire UK hop production area. Uh, uh, the you know they have pests on their on their crops. Uh, one of them is aphids. Uh, I know that when they have aphids on the crop, they use ladybirds to control uh, the aphid, and they stick them on drones and fly them out across the field and do ladybird bombs into the uh, into the hop gardens. Um, you know, it, they are vast areas, and I don't know what the yields are. I mean, the, you know, the, we know that the plants look really great, um, and that's interesting. So one one of the one of the sort of findings for me, you know, the original request for the Innovative Farmer project for me was actually a marketing exercise. I wanted to know what the benefits to the consumer are for uh, using or drinking organic beer. And of course, we know that there's more biodiversity on an organic farm. Uh, we know that there's more soil carbon and I wanted some evidence. You know, we can't market or tell the public without actually having some data. And I wanted to know, well, what does this look like in, in, a, in a hop garden? Uh, we got the farmers together and they said, well, forget about all that. First of all, we just need to grow the things. Let's concentrate on getting varieties that actually disease tolerance. So that's where the project went to. Uh, and what was also interesting is that, you know, conventional farmers are also looking to reduce their chemical intervention. In fact, law, you know, is actually, you know, forcing them to, to, to do less. And they have the same problem. They're still getting those diseases. One of the farms in Herefordshire was growing organic and conventional and I went to see him uh, and I went into his conventional plot and these plants were looking big and green and lush and fantastic. And then we went into his organic um, plot and they looked pretty weedy and thin. Uh, but he said, actually, these organic ones have never suffered from verticillium wilt. Uh, whereas these big lush green ones get it all the time and I'm having to grub them out of the crop. And he said straight away, it's probably because there's just more airflow around the plant. And so uh, they're less susceptible to the, to, the, um, to the fungal attack. So what came out of it really was that we're, we're trying these different varieties. They're being uh, selected out of conventional hop selection. But actually when you plant them in an organic setting, they behave quite differently. You know, because you're not putting added nitrogen on, they're not getting that lush growth. We don't know what's happening under the soil because that soil health, that soil structure, is also probably affecting the, the uh, ability of those plants to combat uh, disease. But we don't really know how or how it's doing it. But you know, definitely we're seeing complete different results for a conventional plant uh, uh, of, of the same variety grown in a conventional setting and an organic setting. And that's a, uh, an element of the project we didn't really quite achieve, did we? <laughs> yeah, hopefully that's the next step. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, and then also at the farms, because um, there was only two of them, um, we were really testing the management as well and also the environment. So that was really important to how successful they are. Because there's such a small amount of farms that are growing organic hops, and that's quite an important element of it for the farmers to actually find the varieties that work on their farm and with their management system as well. Uh, how are we doing with beers? We've, we've tried a, a hemp beer. It, we, we ought to pass around some stinger. So uh, these last two beers we actually did as a partnership with uh, uh, River Cottage. So we, you know, we wanted to sort of celebrate the botanical trio. Uh, so we did a beer, obviously we did a very hoppy beer, hopful. Uh, we did a, a, a nettle beer, Stinger, uh, and you just tried the hen beer. And Stinger uh, literally just has some fresh nettles in at the end of the boil, at the same time as we put in the hops. Uh, it doesn't have any aromatics in it at all. It's purely the sort of vegetal matter that goes in, but it does give it a, a sort of bit of a, a sort of green, slightly uh, fresh flavor. Uh, and I think that probably some of the, the sort of citric acid or whatever from the nettles also makes the, the, the beer a little bit, you know, slightly more acidic and tart. You might get some of that, but that's, otherwise it's quite a, a just a light and refreshing beer. I thought it'd be an interesting one to bring along. Uh, and then when you've done that, we're going to move on to uh, another beer, which is uh, Stroudbury's probably most hoppy beer. It's a beer called uh, Hop, uh, uh, Hop Drop. Uh, where we pack in as much of the sort of most expensive and interesting and aromatic hops that we can we can get our hands on. Uh, and they're largely from New Zealand. Uh, New Zealand has a similar climate. It's got uh, uh, a really sort of favorable climate for, for hop uh, growing. 
and New Zealand's done a good job with its biosecurity as it imports any uh, sort of natural product. They're pretty sure that they don't bring in the diseases. And of course, because they haven't had a history of growing hops, they just don't have that disease bank. And so they have become quite good organic hop growers. And so a lot of our uh, organic hops are shipped from New Zealand. Uh, of course, you know, in terms of uh, provenance, we would uh, like to use more and more UK hops. Uh, if we're looking at uh, sort of global impact, again, because hops are such a tiny fraction of the portion of, of the beer, uh, in terms of carbon footprint, the difference between a UK hop and a New Zealand hop is pretty negligible, really. Um, but there's got to be, you know, better to have a bit more um, uh, sort of uh, resilience, really, by having our own UK grown hops, which have a completely different character as well. Why is it negligible? Uh, because the, we use so little of it. So, you know, substituting New Zealand versus UK, actually the difference is tiny. I mean, there is a, 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 there is a difference, but it's, it's, in terms of carbon, it's, it's not very much. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Yeah, well, those varieties also like they less vigorous varieties, so they get the taller, more skill in their way you Yeah, there's dwarf varieties which would be more suited to like just growing yeah, hedgerow or yeah, they're genetically dwarf. But yeah. Are they the varieties you want to grow? Um, I think they possibly are more suited to an organic system. Um, I think there's less labour involved, but also if you're um, trying to. Um, increase the biodiversity below the where the hops grow. So if you're trying to increase the amount of beneficial insects below the hops, then obviously they're lower down to the ground as well. Um, but what we what Greg was saying with having um, airflow through the hops, obviously the tall hops have more airflow going through them. Um, but it's just different in infrastructure. So. Yeah, they're both they're both as productive. Uh, they use different kit to harvest. So. Uh, a tall hop is probably what you're used to, you know, poles at the end, a wire stretch with strings going up and down. Uh, and when they come to harvest, they literally cut the strings top and bottom, throw them in a trailer. They go into the barn and those strings get stuck onto hooks, which drags it to the machine. Uh, and then the machine sort of uh, brushes off the, the hop cones, the hop flowers, and then they get sorted. The dwarf varieties are grown on nets uh, and uh, they have a bit of kit that straddles the net with combs on it so they go down and it's brushing off the flowers as it goes down the row so it's like harvesting in the field so for uh, you know commercial uh, harvesting and efficiency the dwarf varieties are actually a little better and easier and the kits there you know for it however in an organic setting uh, hops have got to outcompete those weeds and nettles in particular and the nettles grow that high so the hop has got to grow above that height before it even starts flowering so uh, you know, those tall varieties give you more plant above the nettles to actually have flowers on. Um, so, you know, it could be that the tall varieties work a little better in an organic setting for, for yield. Mm. We, we've not really yeah. done that one. No. <laughs> uh, but I suspect, you know, I know that um, managing weeds under the, under the hops is uh, one of the sort of concerns for the, for the uh, growers and also reducing uh, foliage on the lower part of the, the plant so uh, they were using sheep getting sheep in at the right time to go in and nibble them just enough before they start getting the plant so that's a bit of uh, expertise yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, well, uh, again, it's about funding these things. So there's uh, you know, not much funding going into that sort of research. Uh, there has actually been a, recently some funding put in. So there's two 
organizations that are really doing that work. One is Charles Farham, who is a, a hop merchant themselves, and they um, fund their own program, and were largely the sort of supporters and sponsors of the work we did. Uh, and there's another one, which was uh, Y College, isn't it? The Y Hops, which has been sort of ongoing. Uh, and that's where this um, gene uh, um, sort of um, tracing markers is, is working. They actually got some funding to try and accelerate that work, but it's still fairly insignificant. You know, it's a huge, um, you know, huge volume they had to get through. Should we get through, start passing out the hop drops as well, just to move things on? <laughs> <laughs> How are we doing for time? I'm also conscious we started a bit late and uh, we, we probably don't want to finish beyond the half past point. So yes, this is this is a hop drop. It's our super hoppy craft style uh, beer. It's also uh, hazy. All our beers are actually uh, unfiltered, unpasteurized, so there is a bit of haze. Uh, the hop drop is also gluten free, so we use a deglutenizing enzyme. It's a GM free enzyme. It took us a while to get it through uh, certification, but all it does is it digests the protein, the gluten protein, breaks it up. Uh, so gluten is one of the proteins in, in barley malt, uh, and actually as brewers we do quite a good job of getting rid of most of it anyway in our normal brewing process by boiling it, uh, and that just cooks them and denatures them. Uh, but this, this is a, a gluten-free, organic, decor. <laughs> craft beer. been a lot of nettles below, I don't know if that was on purpose or not, um, <laughs> but there's been a lot of nettles that outcompete, um, and then also there's just predominantly grass, I think they might mulch them as well possibly, yeah. um, so that's going to outcompete the weeds, yeah. Uh, and uh, they use, um, is it Phycelia that um, for, for um, insects, you know, just generally in the farm, not so much for the benefit of the hops, but just for uh, the farm as a cover crop. Yeah, exactly. And it's also uh, easy to knock down when they want it, so that's one of the reasons for, for that, um, that particular crop. Um, but I haven't heard of any other sort of green crops they might have used. Um, uh, I think they, they've also used clover, you know, just for a bit of nitrogen, but um, again, it's, it's this uh, broadleaf versus grass, which actually yeah. covers less disease. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I was growing these crop, uh, crops, this is more ornamental and have a go, and uh, they do tolerate quite thick levels of like wet or mulch without the slug being an issue. So that, I thought that was quite interesting, the kind of reality that slugs don't really bother uh, hops. It's just having access to fast volumes of that thick mulch that suppress the weeds. Yeah. I think you're right, I've done the same in my lot when I've got some uh, uh, hops growing and I mulch the allotment with uh, with straw uh, and you're right the, the hops are really quite rough and hardy and slugs don't really go for it um, so but I don't know why why the farmers don't mulch again I wonder if it can harbour fungus when the shoots are emerging that uh, you know they might be worried about that you know and the could, mulch yeah, create more of a damp environment yeah. I guess yeah. for mildew um, yeah. which is like a massive issue with growing hops yeah I'm a cider man, but Sintra has changed my life. <laughs> 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 so I'm back, I'm back in the back in the mix. One day of the weekend I drink cider, one day beer. But so Sintra, the, the grapefruit flavour, yeah. has changed the game. Can we grow that here, or apparently it will not? 
Well, exactly. So we're talking about, you know, hops that have characteristics that brewers want to use. And the UK has got some very traditional varieties that it has grown and it produces those traditional flavours. But of course, the sort of craft brewing scene has produced interest like your own, you know, to try these different uh, hop varieties and they're quite extreme I mean, the, the variety of flavors that come out of a hop can go from you know uh, really earthy grassy minty to super tropical pineapple and all sorts uh, and actually easy mentioned one of them which was 3294 three, three, yeah. uh, which was a cross <laughs> with a, a variety called uh, harlequin which actually was a variety that had cascade in it which is an american very fruity hop uh, and this particular one came out with really sort of uh, fruity um, honeydew melon type flavor so really sweet and uh, and fruity and harlequin uh, is super pineapple -y. you know you can do it's like a real pineapple crush uh, and that was a uk grown hop so they're really excited to get these big bold flavors coming out of a of a uk hop uh, but uh, we see more of that in sunny climate so again you know that that dry climate seems to produce those super intense uh, flavors that uh, people are used to so we're, we're seeing a lot of uh, imported hops and the states has you know done really well at that but we are getting uh, hops from uh, other places Spain grows organic hops uh, uh, Central and Eastern Europe is growing organic hops so they are places that are producing some interesting varieties uh, a bit closer to home the last bit of course oh yeah I processing all of that has to be done on the farm because the brewers want them less ready to go um it te does tend to do, get done on the farm because you're you're harvesting a wet crop you know it's sort of 80 percent moisture uh, and if you put it all in a heap uh, you know it will turn to compost overnight so it's about you know harvesting it separating it drying it as quick as possible uh, and when they dry the hop uh, they put it in a kiln but you don't want to dry it too fast because it kind of becomes all friable and crispy and falls apart. Uh, and if you do it too slowly, then it can rot. If you underdo it, the core of it can also rot. So it's about getting it just right, that you're drying it through, not too quickly, uh, not driving off all the volatiles by putting you know, all that heat in and sending the uh, essential oils up the chimney. So this is quite a skilled and gentle process to, to dry a hop. So there's a lot of, you know, room for error in the, in the, in the process. Once you've even grown the thing. <laughs> you've done really well in preventing us from ever taking an interest in growing hops. <laughs> <laughs> it, 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 you've got to be pretty brave. And what, again, you know, one of the things that we learned was that these two organic uh, hop growers are hooked to the challenge. They are absolutely obsessed by it uh, because it is so difficult, and it, you know, they just want to produce. Uh, a commercial uh, crop out of it and you know what we did note is that they generally haven't lost money have they no. they tend to bring a crop through that covers the cost and then on a good year they will make a bit more money so it is like a cash crop still yeah, yeah and they've said that over the course of the field lab as well more conventional hop farmers have kind of taken more of an interest obviously because of the increase in um, artificial inputs and hopefully that means that more people will be Um, well, I think there's not many like actual applications that you can use, like organic certified applications. Yeah. Um, but I think it's very much what we found the hot farmers is trying to increase the biodiversity in the soil. Um, so from the get-go, there's a bit of resilience there. 
Um, and as Greg was saying with the ladybirds mm. earlier for the aphids, um, so I think there's some kind of more out there ideas that some farmers have had. Um, but with the farmers, they don't really have, they just kind of seeing how it goes. I think it's more just of a, mm. a chance and management kind of. So is it more like reactive? Reactive, yeah, yeah reactive and also, responses. yeah, making yeah. sure the biodiversity. Yeah, Yeah, there's very little intervention. I mean, it's it's mainly about management. So it's they're observing the plants as they're emerging. They're cutting out any diseased um, uh, uh, plants. They're then selecting. You know, it will send out lots of shoots. They reduce it down to six and send two up each string. Um, they might have a you know. Then you've got a reserve in there. Um, uh, they they did use sort of soap products and they for some things um, and then it's biological control so there's not very many interventions yeah. No, I think we're, it's because we're restricted to two farms who need to make a living, who have the infrastructure and set up to do what they're doing. I mean, one of the, the questions or suggestions I had was literally just have a mixture of hot plants in the row. You know, it doesn't matter what they are, as long as they uh, diverse and they, uh, as long as they ripen at roughly the same time would be the critical thing there, or they, you choose, you know, multiple varieties that have the same ripening time then you have that diversity and we get bitterness. It doesn't matter about the flavor and aroma, we just get uh, organic bitterness, which is what you know fundamentally we use most hops for. So that would be a, quite an interesting experiment and it wouldn't matter on the mix and you could probably get a bit of a crop. And that's probably a good thing to bring me on to the final beer, which we've got a little pin on there. Uh, 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 but it, this one here, I, uh, uh, I'm gonna leave it there. Uh, look, not last weekend, the weekend before. So September is hop harvesting season. These, these, these are in flower. Uh, about 16 years ago, my then brewer at the time saw my two little hop plants outside of the brewery and said, why don't we make a brew out of the hops that are growing on your plants? So we did, we did a tiny brew. Uh, and it was really great. And one of our customers came along and said, where are you getting your hops from? We pointed at this puny plant. Uh, and she volunteered to take a cutting and grow it on her allotment. Uh, and that has now sort of exploded into our hop club, which now has about 100 members. Uh, and every year, those members chop down their plants, bring them to the brewery, and we spend the morning listening to jazz and picking off the flowers. Um, and then, but at the same time, we're doing a brew, uh, and in the middle of the day, we take all our green hops and throw them into the kettle. So we don't bother drying them, we put them in as a green hopped brew. Uh, we actually put it into the cask on Tuesday. So this is actually quite a young beer. Ideally, it would have been in the cask a bit longer, it finishes fermenting, it produces more carbon dioxide and carbonates and fizzes up the beer. So it's not as fizzy as it should be, but I couldn't resist bringing one along. So this is a green hopped brew from our community hop club. And what's interesting is that, you know, all these people have got largely the same sort of plants, but every year we seem to get the same or more hops. Uh, 
you know, these people are growing in different locations. They're, some of them will have good years, some of them will have bad years. Uh, but consistently, every year, we get enough hops to do a brew. And that's quite interesting. It's exactly what you're saying. It's about growing them in different places, different environments, uh, and they'll be subject to, uh, you know, different things, but they will come through as a, as a whole. So, yes, this is our annual uh, green hop beer, which we call Brewer's Garden. The barrel's going to be there. You're very welcome to go along and help yourself and have a little taste. There's a few more questions before we go. Can I just do a couple more. Okay. Are you turning any of them into like pellets for, in terms of larger, wider distribution and stuff, and like shelf life? Uh, so hops uh, quite often are pelletized. It makes them easier to transport. Uh, they break up in the in the copper and release their you know their goodies much more readily. Uh, we have a traditional brewery where we actually rely on the uh, the hop plant sort of uh, creating a bed, a sort of leaf bed at the bottom to filter the beer. So we like a certain amount of leaf, but most modern breweries use um, pelletized hops, and certainly you know all the imported hops tend to come through pelletized, like like chicken feed. That uh, kind of pellet, yeah. Yeah. Um, I was just wondering. I missed the very start, so I'm sorry if this has been covered already. But just following on from what Annie was saying, what you were saying about the garden crew um, and the infrastructure needed for drying the hops quickly, I just wondered if there was scope for having uh, local, mobile hop collectors and dryers for areas. So yeah. More growers could grow hops, and then you know you get somebody come to the farm. You pick, help pick them. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that would be good if there were more organic hop growers, I guess. Um, and yeah, I guess that's one of the solutions is having a shared infrastructure. So that, that cost, that burden of that cost is shared as well. Um, I'm not sure about a mobile unit, how that works. Uh, I have, I think I have come across micro oasts that yeah. do exactly that. Uh, but again, it's about the viability, you know, you've got to harvest quite a lot of hop. As an example, that community hop club, we spent, you know, there was probably 40 or 50, 60 people there. We spent three hours picking. Um, we This year we got a record number of hops. So last year was 51 kilos of green hop. The year before was 55. This year we managed to pick 94 kilos of fresh hop. But it was still only enough for half a brew. <laughs> having spent all day, you know, picking those hops by hand. Sorry? Uh, that was uh, 2,000 litres. It was about, about 5,000 pints for that particular brew. Um, so, yes, I mean, it, it, it has to be mechanised to actually make it viable. So hand picking is not a question. You need to have a picking machine, which means you've got to grow them in a way that the picking machine can actually work. Um, and if you go to a... I really recommend going to visit a hop farm. Uh, most of the kit was developed in the late, well, the early 19th you know, century. It's really ancient. They're not making the stuff anymore. Uh, it's cobbled together because it's a declining industry. You know, nobody wants to get into making hop drying machines because, you know, they're going out of fashion. <laughs> so, yeah, it's a, it is a declining industry. Uh, and it's, it'll be interesting to see where it goes. Uh, there are developments. There are... Uh, there's a lot of GM work going in, so actually splicing uh, traits into yeast, because yeast you know, um, um, uh, grows quite rapidly. Uh, so in big commercial settings, there are actually yeasts that produce hop flavors, so you never even have to put a hop into your beer at all. Uh, so that's pretty, pretty scary for the industry. We know that. Ooh. <laughs> okay. Yeah. We're done. Yes. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to hang around and uh, try a, a brewer's garden. If there are any questions, then feel free to ask.